fire is in my ears. Can this be true? Farewell, contempt and scorn, and maiden pride adieu. Benedick, love on! I will requite you, taming my wild heart to your loving hand. It must have been a pleasant sight to see these old enemies converted into new and loving friends, and to behold their first meeting after being cheated into mutual liking by the merry artifice of the good-humoured prince. But a sad reverse in the fortunes of Hero must now be thought of. The morrow, which was to have been her wedding day, brought sorrow on the heart of Hero and her good father Leonato. The prince had a half brother, who came from the wars along with him to Messina. This brother, his name was Don John, was a melancholy, discontented man, whose spirit seemed to labour in the contriving of villainies. He hated the prince, his brother, and he hated Claudio because he was the prince's friend, and determined to prevent Claudio's marriage with Hero, only for the malicious pleasure of making Claudio and the prince unhappy, for he knew the prince had set his heart upon this marriage almost as much as Claudio himself. And to effect this wicked purpose, he employed one Boraccio, a man as bad as himself, whom he encouraged with the offer of a great reward. This Boraccio paid his court to Margaret, Hero's attendant, and Don John, knowing this, prevailed upon him to make Margaret promise to talk with him from her lady's chamber window that night, after Hero was asleep, and also to dress herself in Hero's clothes, the better to deceive Claudio into the belief that it was Hero, for that was the end he meant to compass by this wicked plot. Don John then went to the prince and Claudio, and told them that Hero was an imprudent lady, that she talked with men from her chamber window at midnight. Now this was the evening before the wedding, and he offered to take them that night where they should themselves hear Hero discoursing with a man from her window, and they consented to go along with him, and Claudio said, If I see anything to-night why I should not marry her, to-morrow in the congregation where I intended to wed her, there will I shame her. The prince also said, And as I assisted you to obtain her, I will join with you to disgrace her. When Don John brought them near Hero's chamber that night, they saw Boraccio standing under the window, and they saw Margaret looking out of Hero's window, and heard her talking with Boraccio. And Margaret, being dressed in the same clothes they had seen Hero wear, the prince and Claudio believed it was the lady Hero herself. Nothing could equal the anger of Claudio when he had made, as he thought, this discovery. All his love for the innocent Hero was at once converted into hatred, and he resolved to expose her in the church as he had said he would the next day. And the prince agreed to this, thinking no punishment could be too severe for the naughty lady who talked with a man from her window the very night before she was going to be married to the noble Claudio. The next day, when they were all met to celebrate the marriage, and Claudio and Hero were standing before the priest, and the priest or friar, as he was called, was proceeding to pronounce the marriage ceremony, Claudio, in the most passionate language, proclaimed the guilt of the blameless Hero, who, amazed at the strange words he uttered, said meekly, "'Is my lord well that he does speak so wide?' Leonato, in the utmost horror, said to the prince, "'My lord, why speak not you?' "'What should I speak?' said the prince. "'I stand dishonoured that have gone about to link my dear friend to an unworthy woman. Leonato, upon my honour, myself, my brother, and this grieved Claudio, did see and hear her last night at midnight talk with a man at her chamber window. Benedick, in astonishment at what he heard, said, "'This looks not like a nuptial.' "'True, O oh God!' replied the heart-struck hero and then this hapless lady sank down in a fainting-fit, to all appearance, dead. The prince and Claudio left the church without staying to see if Hero would recover, or at all regarding the distress into which they had thrown Leonato. So hard-hearted had their anger made them. Benedick remained and assisted Beatrice to recover Hero from her swoon, saying, "'How does the lady?' "'Dead, I think,' replied Beatrice in great agony, for she loved her cousin, and knowing her virtuous principles, she believed nothing of what she had heard spoken against her. Not so the poor old father. He believed the story of his child's shame, and it was piteous to hear him lamenting over her, as she lay like one dead before him, wishing she might never more open her eyes. But the ancient friar was a wise man, and full of observation on human nature, and he had attentively marked the lady's countenance when she heard herself accused, and noted a thousand blushing shames start into her face, and then he saw an angel-like whiteness bear away those blushes and in her eye he saw a fire that did belie the error that the prince did speak against her maiden truth, and he said to the sorrowing father, "'Call me a fool. Trust not my reading nor my observation. Trust not my age, my reverence, nor my calling, if this sweet lady lie not guiltless here under some biting error.' When Hero had recovered from the swoon into which she had fallen, the friar said to her, "'Lady, what man is he you are accused of?' Hero replied, "'They know not that do accuse me. I know of none.' 
Then, turning to Leonato, she said, Oh, my father, if you can prove that any man has ever conversed with me at hours unmeet, or that I yesternight changed words with any creature, refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. There is, said the friar, some strange misunderstanding in the prince and Claudio. And then he counselled Leonato that he should report that Hero was dead, and he said that the death like swoon in which they had left Hero would make this easy of belief. And he also advised him that he should put on mourning and erect a monument for her, and do all rites that appertain to a burial. What shall become of this? said Leonato. What will this do? The friar replied, This report of her death shall change slander into pity. That is some good. But that is not all the good I hope for. When Claudio shall hear she died upon hearing his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into his imagination. Then shall he mourn, if ever love had interest in his heart, and wish that he had not so accused her, yea, though he thought his accusation true. Benedict now said, Leonato, let the friar advise you, and though you know well I love the prince and Claudio, yet on my honour I will not reveal this secret to them. Leonato, thus persuaded, yielded, and said sorrowfully, I am so grieved that the smallest twine may lead me. The kind friar then led Leonato and Hero away to comfort and console them. And Beatrice and Benedict remained alone, and this was the meeting from which their friends, who contrived the merry plot against them, expected so much diversion. Those friends who were now overwhelmed with affliction, and from whose minds all thoughts of merriment seemed for ever banished. Benedict was the first who spoke, and he said, Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer, said Beatrice. Surely, said Benedict, I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. Ah, said Beatrice, how much might that man deserve of me who would write her? Benedict then said, Is there any way to show such friendship? I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? It were as possible, said Beatrice, for me to say I loved nothing in the world so well as you. But believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, said Benedict, you love me, and I protest I love you. Come, bid me do anything for you. Kill Claudio, said Beatrice. <laughs> Not for the world, said Benedict, for he loved his friend Claudio, and he believed he had been imposed upon. Is not Claudio a villain that has slandered, scorned, and dishonoured my cousin? said Beatrice. Oh, that I were a man! Hear me, Beatrice, said Benedict. But Beatrice would hear nothing in Claudio's defence, and she continued to urge on Benedict to revenge her cousin's wrongs, and she said, Talk with a man out of the window, a proper saying. Sweet hero, she is wronged, she is slandered, she is undone. Oh, that I were a man for Claudio's sake, or that I had any friend who would be a man for my sake! But valour is melted into courtesies and compliments. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Tarry, good Beatrice, said Benedict, by this hand I love you. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it, said Beatrice. Think on your soul that Claudio has wronged hero, asked Benedict. Yea answered Beatrice, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough, said Benedict, I am engaged, I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand and so leave you. By this hand Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear from me, so think of me. Go, comfort your cousin. While Beatrice was thus powerfully pleading with Benedict, and working his gallant temper, by the spirit of her angry words, to engage in the cause of Hero, and fight even with his dear friend Claudio, Leonato was challenging the prince and Claudio to answer with their swords the injury they had done his child, who, he affirmed, had died for grief. But they respected his age and his sorrow, and they said, Nay, do not quarrel with us, good old man. And now came Benedict, and he also challenged Claudio to answer with his sword the injury he had done to Hero, and Claudio and the prince said to each other, Beatrice had set him on to do this. Claudio, nevertheless, must have accepted this challenge of Benedict, had not the justice of heaven at the moment brought to pass a better proof of the innocence of Hero than the uncertain fortune of a duel. While the prince and Claudio were yet talking of the challenge of Benedict, a magistrate brought Boraccio as a prisoner before the prince. Boraccio had been overheard talking with one of his companions of the mischief he had been employed by Don John to do. Boraccio made a full confession to the prince in Claudio's hearing, that it was Margaret, dressed in her lady's clothes, that he had talked with from the window, whom they had mistaken for the lady Hero herself. And no doubt continued on the minds of Claudio and the prince on the innocence of Hero. If a suspicion had remained, it must have been removed by the flight of Don John, who, finding his villainies were detected, fled from Messina to avoid the just anger of his brother. The heart of Claudio was sorely grieved when he found he had falsely accused Hero, who, he thought, 
died upon hearing his cruel words, and the memory of his beloved hero's image came over him in the rare semblance that he loved at first. And the prince, asking him if what he heard did not run like iron through his soul, he answered that he felt as if he had taken poison while Borachio was speaking. And the repentant Claudio implored forgiveness of the old man Leonato for the injury he had done his child, and promised that, whatever penance Leonato would lay upon him for his fault in believing the false accusation against his betrothed wife, for her dear sake he would endure it. The penance Leonato enjoined him was to marry the next morning a cousin of Hero's, who, he said, was now his heir, and in person very like Hero. Claudio, regarding the solemn promise he made to Leonato, said he would marry this unknown lady, even though she were an Ethiop. But his heart was very sorrowful, and he passed that night in tears and in remorseful grief at the tomb which Leonato had erected for Hero. When the morning came, the prince accompanied Claudio to the church, where the good friar and Leonato and his niece were already assembled to celebrate a second nuptial. And Leonato presented to Claudio his promised bride, and she wore a mask that Claudio might not discover her face. And Claudio said to the lady in the mask, Give me your hand before this holy friar. I am your husband if you will marry me. And when I lived, I was your other wife, said this unknown lady, and taking off her mask, she proved to be no niece, as was pretended, but Leonato's very daughter, the lady hero herself. We may be sure that this proved a most agreeable surprise to Claudio, who thought her dead, so that he could scarcely for joy believe his eyes, and the prince, who was equally amazed at what he saw, exclaimed, Is not this hero, hero that was dead? Leonato replied, She died, my lord, but while her slander lived. The friar promised them an explanation of this seeming miracle after the ceremony was ended, and was proceeding to marry them when he was interrupted by Benedick, who desired to be married at the same time to Beatrice. Beatrice making some demur to this match, and Benedick challenging her with her love for him, which he had learned from Hero, a pleasant explanation took place, and they found that both had been tricked into a belief of love which had never existed, and had become lovers in truth by the power of a false jest. But the affection which a merry invention had cheated them into was grown too powerful to be shaken by a serious explanation, and since Benedict proposed to marry, he was resolved to think nothing of the purpose that the world could say against it, and he merrily kept up the jest and swore to Beatrice that he took her but for pity, and because he heard she was dying of love for him, and Beatrice protested that she yielded but upon great persuasion, and partly to save his life, for she heard he was in a consumption. So these two mad wits were reconciled and made a match of it, after Claudio and Hero were married. And to complete the history, Don John, the contriver of the villainy, was taken in his flight and brought back to Messina, and a brave punishment it was to this gloomy, discontented man to see the joy and feastings which, by the disappointment of his plots, took place in the palace in Messina. End of story.